Can you and I know that the Bible is in fact the inspired words of God? Can we know that for sure? That's the subject we'll look, to, look at today. The good news was written and the full truth revealed That the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real Our Lord in His wisdom gave Him gifts from above The Spirit then taught them the truth in love Welcome to The Truth in Love And now your host, Dave Miller Greetings and welcome to our program. In our last program, we were examining some of the claims which the Bible itself makes for its own inspired authenticity. We looked at a number of passages in order to understand that the Bible claims to be inspired, and we looked at passages that give us kind of a, an understanding of what inspiration is, what it consists of. The last passage that we examined was Hebrews chapter 1. If you have your Bible and would like to flip over there or jot it down and study it at your leisure, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 through 13, study that passage on your own. In that section, in chapter 1 of Hebrews, the inspired writer quotes from Psalm 2, verse 7, 2 Samuel 7, verse 14, Deuteronomy 32, 43, Psalm 104, 4, Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7, Psalm 102, 25 through 27, and Psalm 110, verse 1, a string of quotations from the Old Testament. And in each of those passages in Hebrews 1, the Hebrews writer attributes these passages to God as the speaker. But if you go back and examine those passages in their original setting in the Old Testament, Sometimes God is the speaker, but at other times He is not the speaker. Sometimes, in fact, God is being spoken to or being spoken about. Now, why would the Hebrew writer, Hebrews writer, indiscriminately assign all of those Old Testament passages to God? Answer, because they all have in common the fact that they are the words of Scripture. Since they are the words of Scripture... They are the words of God. The same thing is true in Romans 15. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans 15 and look at verses 9 through 12. There Paul quotes from the following verses. Psalm 18, verse 49. Deuteronomy 32, 43. Psalm 117, verse 1. Isaiah 11, verse 10. The first of those passages Paul introduces with the little formula, it is written. The second passage is introduced by, again, he says. The third is introduced with simply the word, again. And the fourth is prefaced with the words, Isaiah says. And yet, once again, if you go back to the Old Testament, look at the original setting, only the Isaiah passage is specifically God talking. And yet Paul assigns those words to Isaiah. That forces us to conclude that the expressions, it is written, he says, Isaiah says, are all different ways of saying the same thing. That is, God says. We also need to observe that sometimes the New Testament writers assign Scripture to its human authors. And yet it is clear that when the writer said, uh, Moses said, or David said, or Jeremiah said. That's simply another way to say Scripture says, which is simply another way to say, or the same thing as saying God says. Notice that the inspiration which the Bible claims for itself is in fact verbal inspiration, verbal. It extends to the words, not merely the thought. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, for example, Paul hangs his argument on a plural noun and insists that God intended that word to be understood in its singular sense. The word is seed there. So his argument depended upon a word and, and its uh, proper understanding in terms of its 
grammatical form. We noticed uh, in our last program how Jesus hung his argument on the precise verbal form of Scripture. That's in John chapter 10, verse 34, and his treatment of the psalm that he quoted. He based his point on a particular word in Matthew 22, 43. And in Matthew 22, 32, Jesus based his argument on a particular tense. And in Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 18, he even made a point which depends upon the very letters of Scripture and even the minute strokes of the Hebrew language that formed a part of a letter. In fact, in the Matthew 22, 32 passage, Jesus said Exodus 3, 6 was spoken to the Sadducees of his day with whom he was conversing. And yet if you go back and examine the original context of Exodus 3, 6, God was speaking to Moses at the burning bush. Now, why would Jesus quote that passage and say, that Jesus was talking to you Sadducees? Because Jesus expected all people on the planet through all of history to understand that the Bible is written to all of us. It's intended to be authoritative for our lives. It may have been addressed to other people long, long ago, far, far away, but the entire Bible inspired by God applies to everyone today and forever. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul also affirmed verbal inspiration. For example, in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 2, he claimed that his speech and his preaching were not words of man's wisdom. Rather, his words were in demonstration of the Spirit. That proves inspiration applies to the words. In verse 7 of that chapter, he claimed that he and his fellow apostles were speaking the wisdom of God. In verse 10, he claimed that the things which they had been speaking were revealed to them by God through the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 2, he said it very clearly, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Spirit, the Holy Spirit teaches. So inspiration, according to the Bible's own record of itself, involves the very words. That makes the inspiration of the Bible verbal inspiration. Another point that we could make about this subject, most of the passages that we've examined in our last program and, and today are New Testament references that refer to the inspiration of the Old Testament. And I've heard liberal scholars claim that the New Testament does not make the claim of inspiration for itself. It only says that the Old Testament was. Well, I'm here to tell you today that is simply not true. We looked in a previous program at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Do you remember there, Peter classified Paul's epistles as Scripture, as carrying such divine authority that those who distort or twist the Scriptures that Paul has written will be destroyed. That proves New Testament inspiration, at least to Paul's letters. We also noted how Peter linked the apostles with the Old Testament prophets. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, the same inspiration that applied to the Old Testament prophets applied to the apostles. And we just examined Paul's comparable claim in 1 Corinthians 2, where Paul says, We apostles are speaking the words of God. As you read the New Testament, it is clear that the writers made the extension of Old Testament inspiration to their own writings. They do not consider for a moment themselves, the ministers of the new covenant, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, as being any less in possession of the Spirit of God than the ministers of the old covenant, the Old Testament. Jesus, without question, declared the impending inspiration of the authors of the New Testament on several occasions. In Matthew chapter 5, for example, 17 through 20, and the parallels in Mark 13, 11, Luke 12, 12, there Jesus explained to the apostles that the Holy Spirit would direct their verbal activities in terms of both how and what they spoke. He reiterated the, the, the same thing in Luke 21, verses 12 through 15. 
There he urged them not to even worry how to defend themselves when they would be hauled in before the authorities. Because he said, I'll provide you with a mouth and wisdom, which he said all of your adversaries will not even be able to withstand. Then we have the promises that are given in three chapters in the book of John. John chapter 14, 15, and 16. Let's look at just one, one passage, although all three chapters make the same point. In John 16, verses 12 through 13, Jesus made the following promise to the apostles. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak from Himself, but what things soever He will hear, these He will speak. And He will declare unto you the things that are to come. Do you know in Acts chapter 1 verse 5, Jesus, before ascending back into heaven, promised to the apostles the impending baptism of the Holy Spirit, which according to Acts 1 verse 8, would enable them to be Christ's witnesses throughout the world. That very promise made in John 14, 15, 16, reiterated in Acts 1, commenced its fulfillment in Acts 2, when the apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit and empowered to preach the message that God wanted them to preach. That is inspiration. Numerous passages indicate the fulfillment of those promises to the apostles. I mean, even to the extent that the words which they spoke and wrote were God's words. Go look at Acts 4, verse 8, and Acts 4, verse 31. Go to Acts 5, 32. Read Acts 15, verse 8, and then verse 27 through 28, or Acts 16, verses 6 through 8. We mentioned earlier in our program, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul claimed direct guidance of the Holy Spirit for the words which he spoke. He did the same thing in Galatians 1:12. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, he claimed that his message was made known unto him by revelation along with the other apostles and prophets. So passage after passage reflects this same point. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1, study that passage. Galatians 2, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. And 1 Thessalonians 2, and verse 13. These are just a few of the passages. In fact, a good summary of Paul's claim to inspiration, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. Listen to these words. Paul wrote, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, and there he's talking about having miraculous ability, let him take knowledge of the things which I write unto you, that they are the commandment of the Lord. That is an incredible claim to inspiration. And you know Paul's inspiration extended both to his oral utterances as well as to his written utterances. In 1 Timothy 5, 8, for example, Paul quoted Luke 10, verse 7, and referred to it as Scripture. Do you understand that means that the Gospel of Luke was already available and classified with the inspired canon of Scripture when Paul wrote that letter. So what must we conclude then about the claims which Scripture makes for inspiration? Well, you can easily see the Bible claims for itself the status of inspiration. It claims that it's been breathed out by God Himself, that God breathed the product, the result, written revelation. That inspiration entails such superintendence by God that even the words have come under His influence. And so we affirm very clearly as Christians, the Bible is verbally inspired. We are not implying that the writers merely took dictation. Some people have accused Christians of believing in dictation inspiration. I do not believe in that. In fact, the Bible indicates that God adapted His inspiring activity to the individual temperament, uh, vocabulary, 
stylistic idiosyncrasies of every one of the writers. So, for example, if you were to go to Luke and read Luke or read the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, you understand that Luke was a physician by trade, a professional medical personnel. Do you know that when you read Luke or you read Acts, you will find references to medical terminology that you do not find in the other writers? That proves that God inspired Luke to write God's words, but to do it in such a way that it incorporated Luke's own vocabulary, his own temperament, his own style. That is the inspiration of the Bible. Now notice, the Bible makes certain claims for inspiration. It claims to be the infallible, inerrant, verbally inspired Word of God. But you know, critics and skeptics have assailed and attacked the Bible through the centuries in an effort to discredit its claims, and they have attempted to do that by identifying what they claim are contradictions and discrepancies. Let's move now to an examination of some of these alleged discrepancies. How many ever we have time for? I have found the, the study of these matters to be rewarding and thrilling because in every case, the Bible is vindicated. Its divine status, its divine origin, reconfirmed. Let's begin with the alleged contradiction in which Stephen, in his great speech, great sermon, Acts 7, and verse 14, where Stephen referred to Jacob's family having moved down to Egypt, and when in Egypt, he says, they numbered 75. And yet, if you flip back to Genesis 46, 27, there Moses gives us the number as 70. So critics of the Bible claim to have found a discrepancy. Stephen says 75, Moses says 70. If they would have only studied the matter a little more closely, they would have found out the answer to that. Genesis 46, 26 numbers Jacob's children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren as 66. To that number, which does not include Jacob's sons' wives, Moses adds Jacob, Joseph, and Joseph's two sons. So, 4 added to 66, there is the number 70. But going back to Acts chapter 7, Stephen did not include Joseph and his wife and two sons in the number that he tallied because they were already in Egypt. Remember, they sent for the family. Joseph is in fact said to have sent for Jacob and the relatives while he was still in Egypt. So, Stephen names Jacob separately from the 75 relatives. So Stephen's number includes the 66 that were mentioned in Genesis 46, 26, plus he adds the nine wives of Jacob's sons. And you must understand at that, that point in history, Judas' wife and Simeon's wife were already deceased. What number do you come up with? You come up with the same number uh, the, explaining why Stephen said the number was 75. So the Bible harmonizes perfectly, and there is no discrepancy. A second example of an alleged error in the Bible is found in Mark chapter 2, verse 26. There Jesus speaks of Abiathar, whereas the original incident, if you go back to 1 Samuel 21, there you find a reference to Ahimelech. And it appears that we've got two different people being referred to. Well, there have been several plausible solutions to this apparent disparity, uh, any one of which satisfactorily absolves the Bible of error. Let me postulate two. Abiathar and Ahimelech could be the same person because you realize many people in antiquity had multiple or alternate names. For example, Moses' father-in-law is called both Jethro, Exodus 3.1, and Ruel, Exodus 2.18. Same man, two different names. Jethro is not a proper name, but simply a title of honor. Another example, Azariah 
and Uzziah are two different names referring to the same man in 2 Kings 15 verses 1 through 7 and 2 Chronicles 26. So it's not unheard of that one man can have two different names, and we even recognize that in our own society. So that's one explanation. Another explanation is the fact that Jesus did not actually say that Abiathar was ministering to David. He simply indicated that the incident occurred during the days of Abiathar. Well, in the days of means during the lifetime of that individual. So if you go back and read beyond 1 Samuel 21, guess what? You'll see that Ahimelech was Abiathar's father. Ahimelech was present when David made his appearance at uh, Nob, this location. Abiathar would have been present as a priest just like his father. He would have become high priest upon the death of his father. Whenever, uh, by the way, his father was executed by Saul shortly after this incident where David escaped. So Samuel refers to Ahimelech as priest. Jesus refers to Abiathar as high priest. But that again shows the precision with which the Bible avoids contradiction. Referring to Abiathar as high priest can be a, a, an instance of prolepsis. That's a species of anachronism. That's where a person's position later in his life is projected back onto the time when he actually attained the position. For example, if we were to speak of uh, President Abraham Lincoln when he was a boy. Well, when he was a boy, he wasn't the president. But we will speak of him and project that back to a different moment in his life. So that explains that alleged contradiction. Let's look at a third one. The charge that the Bible teaches that the earth is flat. I mean, critics have gone to passages like Job 22:14. Uh, Daniel chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. What about Revelation 7, 1, which speaks of the four corners of the earth? They claim the Hebrew cosmology uh, at that time was patterned after paganism, like the Babylonians and other primitive neighbors who conceived of the sun revolving around the earth. But as usual, the critics are not being fair with the biblical text. They are not showing the same consideration which they show for other writings. Because you see, passages like Job are Hebrew poetry, which employs the same license of figurative expression that modern poetry enjoys. Uh, Daniel, for example, filled with apocalyptic material that is packed with symbols and signs. To charge the Bible with inaccuracy in passages like that is equivalent to impugning a man's honesty for saying something like, hey, it's, it's raining cats and dogs today. We understand what we mean by that. If we, with all of our modern technology, still speak on at the 6 p.m. evening news of sunrise and sunset, surely we can afford the biblical writers the same luxury without questioning their accuracy of expression. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that the earth is round. In fact, technically spherical. Isaiah 40, verse 22. The King James refers to God sitting upon the circle of the earth, but the Hebrew term translated circle literally means round or spherical. In Luke 17, 34 through 36, conditions are described there that could only be true if the earth is round so that there would be night and day occurring at the same time. So you see then that passage after passage shows, in fact, that the Bible recognizes certain astronomical and geological fe uh, features that people of that day did not recognize. That's proof of inspiration. And when one looks at passages that on the surface seem to share the same misconceptions of the day and examine it more deeply, you find that's simply not the case. These contradictions are alleged. They are not true. I'll be back in just a moment.
hope that you are enjoying this study on inspiration. We have so much more material to cover. We've looked already at uh, some of the passages that demonstrate the kind of inspiration which the Bible claims for itself. The Bible clearly claims to be supernaturally directed, written and produced and originated by God Himself through the human instrumentality of inspired writers. We've looked today at some of the alleged discrepancies or contradictions in the Bible and seen the few we've had time to look at that these do not uh, justify making that charge against the Bible. We'll look at some more of these on our next program. This entire series entitled The Bible is Inspired is available to you, the viewer, free of charge if you'll simply write us at the Truth in Love, P.O. Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. Request the series on Bible inspiration. We'll be happy to send you free audio cassette tapes that you may study this material on your own. I urge you to determine whether or not the Bible is inspired, whether or not there are any other documents on the planet are inspired. I'm convinced you will conclude there's only one inspired book from the God of the universe. It's the Bible. We'd better study it, live it, and obey it. Hope to see you next time. Wonderful revelation has been given to man. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of men. Speak the truth in love and grow up unto Him.